Uh, yeah, well, everyone, thanks for joining us. And Scott, thanks for joining us as well on LinkedIn Live. Super excited to have you. I'm excited. Oh, always good to do a LinkedIn Live on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, tell best, us what's Best time of the week to do it. <laughs> tell us what's in that fridge behind you. Uh, so this, is, this, is, this is my like storage area oh, okay. where I literally have nothing in there. I don't know. I figured at some point I needed a place to put stuff, but there's literally nothing <laughs> in there. I think I have like granola bars. Um, and those are magnets. Like I'm, I'm adding magnets to like spice up my background because I don't have the the exposed pipes that that, cool. that, 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 that you that you have, which like look very nice. Those are yeah. some high quality exposed pipes. Thanks. Yeah, they keep us warm. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Well, so I'll excited to kick off. Uh, Scott is the founder and CEO of Brooklyn Data, um, a data consultancy that serves several different companies and helps them modernize their data stack and reporting. Um, super, super excited to get his take on many things throughout the data ecosystem. Scott, welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really fun just to talk data with smart data people. And so like, I'm always up for a data chat. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, um, I guess one thing I'd love to talk about is what are you excited about as the data stack changes? Ooh, I am excited. And I actually, and I, and I'm saying this not because I, I think, I know this is a topic that you like, but I'm genuinely excited about it. I'm excited about like production data applications. Oh, nice. Yeah. I mean, and we did not, and I did not prepare you and tell you this, but I, um, it's, I, I think we are, there's, there's a bunch of chapters that are, that are changing right now. We're, we're, we're moving from this like, um, introduction to the modern data stack, um, Snowflake, you know, DBT, kind of mm -hmm. all that jazz, uh, uh, to to a couple of things like people. I guess there's two segments. There's like these internal use cases, and I think the next step that people are going on in that wave are kind of being more cost conscious. They're like, mm -hmm. "Ooh, we're exiting the wave of just you know being able to do anything in Snowflake, and now they're they're you know entering the stage. It's like, oh shoot, it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I need to optimize. We're now starting a, another kind of chapter of people just starting to build production data products and we're actually seeing it with a bunch of our clients um that like i, I was talking that was dinner last night and i think i was chatting with some other folks about this is that um what we call data products today i think we will kind of look back and not laugh at but just like wait that wasn't really a data product mm -hmm. you know what we're doing today is like um you know an externally facing like looker embed or or a, you know a data share like cool definitely new and, and really good usage of the technologies. I think we're, you know, when we're looking at Streamlit, you know, um, kind of other new technologies, you know, 12 to 18 months from now, we will actually be building production data products. And I, and mm -hmm. I think we're just starting that. The, the space isn't mature enough, but like, I'm pumped. I'm yeah, really what pumped are some that. Um, ideas that you've seen around that, like either with your clients or would conceptually? Well, I mean, I think like, I, I'll, I'll talk even about kind of some, some, types of use cases you're right now the the technologies out there and like everybody's using snowflake and we love snowflake and we use it i would say for most of our clients use snowflake um big fans of it um it's really great for analytical workloads transformations like transactional kind of workloads it's not mm -hmm. as performant and it's not as cost effective you can do it but i think you know we need the ecosystem around these modern data platforms to 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 evolve like you know snowflake is a phenomenal focused product it's a it's a data warehouse um i i think it, it needs to evolve to be a data platform it needs to have multiple products it needs to have like a caching layer it needs to have like kind of elastic search it needs to have s3 it needs to have kind of things a little bit more bundled you can mm -hmm. do all these things but it should be easier and i imagine it'll be easier in the next 18 months like it has to be yeah, I totally agree. And I've always been thinking through, like, does Snowflake um, have that responsibility to build that caching layer and that infrastructure? Or do other startups in the space kind of take on that responsibility? Like, we are seeing some new companies pop up around that concept of, like, serving uh, data off of Snowflake in faster databases. Totally. Um, are you excited? Yeah, I mean, yeah I, I, honestly, I think the answer is a little column A, a little column B. Like, sure. and column B could be bought and become column A. Like, mm -hmm. like it, it's, I think it's going to be a combination. That we need to get there through, I think my, I would imagine that Snowflake is both investing in these tools internally and then building the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I guess like, 
how long do you think this kind of thing takes to pan out and who are the consumers of it? Is it internal users or is it actually could actually be external users as well? Of the data products? Yeah. I mean, I think like the big thing is going to be external. I think mm. that the big, the big thing that makes a data product, a data product. And again, like you can view your internal BI instance as a data product, but I think what I think about is something with greater complexity, greater scale and more like rigorous SLAs. Like mm. if my internal BI tool goes down, not goes down, but isn't up to date for like a couple hours, not great, but not the end of the world. If, you know, the tool that feeds my personalization algorithm or lets me check, lets my clients check, um, you know, the state of their portfolio goes down or even takes more than a, like a millisecond, that's an issue. And so we're, we're going to be entering a territory that just like the SLA is like, you know, people aren't writing their internal BI stacks for to have like five nines, like uptime, but we're going to have like a year and a half from now, we will be writing applications that run natively on Snowflake that have finite five nines of uptime, have redundancy where you can roll over to another Snowflake region mm -hmm. or another, another kind of cloud provider, but just like some people do some of this stuff but not really right now. And it's hard. Yeah. I was talking to Emily, uh, who used to be the head of data at Netlify. Mm -hmm. And she was mentioning that at some point, the data team got pager duty because they were powering the entire billing stack. And so anything that broke in billing would be the data team's responsibility and they'd start getting paged. And I think that was like her, her point around like, that's when the data team transitioned to becoming responsible for, for production mm -hmm. uh, or, for, or for prod rather than for analytics. But uh, they're not set up, they don't have the right tools. Like, I mean, like PageDuty, yeah, that will tell you, but like, we don't have the right monitoring, you know, the teams aren't the right size, mm -hmm. there aren't established paradigms. Like, it's so immature right now. And it's kind of, I think, like, what Emily's team was asked to do is necessary, but almost unfair. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. like, hey, I need you to, like, yeah, I'll give you an example. You know, it was, I, I remember earlier in my career, so I started my career in management consulting. I like we had these big monster Excel sheets, and somehow I was expected to to keep this thing accurate and no mistakes. There's no unit testing. There's no nothing. It was just no version controlling. I mean, I literally had nightmares every night. Um, and so the first time I saw code with unit testing that you could, or like you know, some sort of CI/CD process where you could both in development and kind of when merging, you could verify that it's working was like mind blowing. And so mm -hmm. I think we need that same level of tooling to yeah. make it so it's not like right now to have a production data product, you got to feel like you're pulling or pushing a rock up a hill. Like, it's just like, it is not, you're not set up for six. I mean, you'll do it and your company is probably needs to do it, but you're not set up for success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree. I saw you wrote an article on the locally optimistic blog about uh -oh. data warehouse <laughs> Have an SLA. Um, I'm, it's, uh, this is this is funny because I like I, I I think of myself as original, but I'm just repeating myself from three years ago. That's so funny. Uh, what was that? What is that piece about? I know there's a part one and a part two. Well, so I mean, I actually that's that's a really good question. Um, I, I think what I kind of early learned on my career is that like I'll tell you it's the origin stories. Like when something would break. I would just try to fix it real fast before anybody noticed. Mm -hmm. And I would actually have to take on the burden of the stress of just like something breaking this out of my control. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's shifting from, uh, uh, it's not abdicating responsibility, it's knowing what you can control and what you can't control and actually being thoughtful about kind of like the SLAs and the parameters that you can deliver on and what happens when you don't. Because the, the answer isn't like, well, what do we do when it breaks? The answer isn't like, it should never break. It's like, well, we're going to put these processes in place so it breaks, so it's up 99.99% of time. And when it does break, we'll do X. Mm -hmm. And I do think shifting from that, like, you know, carrying the weight of the world on your shoulder to just being transparent, like, these are our bulletproof uh, bulletproof um, kind of metrics. And the SLA is always is to be up 99.99% of the time and won't message you. These are kind of the new ones and these are completely experimental and we don't guarantee at all. And just like kind of being very transparent. I think transparency is, is, is just a big thing. And I, early in my career, I always thought it was like, I don't know, embarrassing or detracted from my like 
people's confidence in me if things broke. And you listen, you can't have things break all the time. But I think it is actually the more mature responses to know that things will break and and try to put mechanisms to to kind of promise exact like mm -hmm. how and when and what will happen if they do. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's more but, realistic. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, switching gears a bit, what do you think uh, changes about like data practitioners as they become more um, like tuned for like production applications? Like, does the structure of a data team change? Does the skill set change? Or can they kind of stay similar and utilize like new products and new technology instead? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And I, I, let me start off by saying, I don't think what we're doing today goes away. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, an additional. So the career path of an analytics engineer, an analyst, like tools may change, the paradigms might slightly change, it might mature, but we will, this, these roles will exist. I think you will see new roles mm. of, and I wouldn't even call them data engineers. I would call them like data products engineers mm -hmm. um, and, and, and folks that are building production applications. And I do think data engineers today, analytics engineers, analysts in the modern data stack, I do believe have learned a lot of really, really great things from the engineering world. Um, you know, we've learned how to, um, you know, version control, write dry code, um, write performant code. But I think there's just a whole nother level of engineering when you're building a, you know, um, a real-time trading platform on Snowflake. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so I think you're just going to see a class of like full stack engineers that are specializing in specializing in the data clouds. Yeah, do you think like SREs, like that kind of role would move over to the data world too? Um, that kind of? Person? Yeah, I mean, I, I think literally every single role that you see. Yeah, for software. For software is going to gonna move over there. Very interesting. Okay. And like, because you're just like right now, it's like, you know, we have these conversations with, with, with clients and, we, you know, we'll build. So what we'll do is we come in, we advise our clients on how to design their data stack. Um, we implement their data warehouse, ingest the data, model it and, 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 and um, visualize it. And then sometimes they'll come to us to use cases like, I, how do I drive personalization off of that? I like mm -hmm. it needs to be real time. And like, historically, the conversation was, I think you need to talk to your production team and just do that internally and kind of run some sort of streaming kind of platform. And I think we may have either lost Scott a bit. Ooh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep, you're back. Oh, cool. So I think we're. It's, I guess what we're we're going to 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 move towards is a space where it's not a debate of. Right now, it's not a debate for some applications. It's like these things will happen stuff like in your data platform, and these things will happen in your Postgres and your kind of mm -hmm. Rails or your Node.js app. We're going to get to a place where it's like it could go either way. It doesn't matter. And right. then we're going to get to a place where it's definitively better in some use cases to build it on a data cloud. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you like believe in like most people when they hear data cloud, they think it's like jargon or like kind of made up. Do you believe in that? I do. I mean, I, I, I believe that, you know, the future of platforms like, and I've been saying Snowflake because I think it's the biggest, it's like Snowflake, Databricks, um, Firebolt, ClickHouse Inc. Um, mm -hmm. is not to be a data warehouse. It is to be a multi-product ecosystem where you can spin up end-to-end, -end, you know, production products. Yeah, yeah. At some point, Snowflake uh, with like Snowpark had this like brilliant idea around being able to host your application itself. Like you just be able to upload your Python or Node.js and then um, they would actually host the UI. Do you think that kind of stuff, like, I mean, you're alluding to it already, but like, would you bet on that kind of stuff like working or like kind of like landing with companies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely. Just, but I think you'll just see lots of entry points because you're going to have people that kind of want that more. Like there's a reason people use Heroku. And AWS, there are different experiences, and let you customize different things, and let you mm -hmm. do you know. But you can do the exact same thing with both, like mm -hmm. the end result. And so you're going to see the same thing, I imagine, with tools like Snowflake. There's going to be a kind of more turnkey, self-hosted or turnkey, like you know, managed service type, um, where you don't really have to look at the bells and whistles. And then there's going to be, um, you know, the version where you can really get in there and and just customize everything. Yeah. Uh, do you think? I mean, so it sounds like you have a lot of ideas in the data productionization space. Uh -huh. Do you think Brooklyn Data would ever go and develop any of those into a product? Ooh, 
That's a really great question. Um, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. Like, I just like, I am so like, every time I see like someone that starts a task, I'm like, I'm not smart enough to do that. I, I, I like, I, I, um, it's, I think us being a professional services team, is just like so core to our being like, we love, you know, I was kind of, you know, like all joking aside, it's like, I just love the ability to play with every single product out there. I love the ability to get in high touch and Snowflake and BigQuery and Databricks and and just kind of craft a solution. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, that's what we do really well at Brooklyn Data. And that's like the folks that we hire do really well is 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 just like they love learning about all these new technologies. Like where else would you get to come into a company and have a login to every single cloud pl- data platform out there and and be able to try them all out and have, you know, every other week we have a demo where a brand new SaaS pro- data product comes mm-hmm. in demos. Like, you know, we have shared Slack channels with every like data, uh, like data SaaS product. Like we're meeting regularly with like folks like yourself, Kishish, and, and, and leadership and just hearing from the founders about these data products. Like I kind of think I've got the coolest job. I mean, I don't want to say it too loud because I don't want everybody <laughs> else to, to, to do it, but like it's the coolest job in the world. I get to play with every tool, um, work with, amazing companies of all shapes and sizes and craft custom data solutions. Like for me, it feels like a dream job. I, I love that. I mean, would love to hear about like some of those tools that you've discovered, um, especially the ones that are lesser known. I think we all know about the big ones um, that are already pretty commonly used, but are there any up and coming ones or any ones that you think are just really exciting? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a few, like there's, there's, and I guess I'll focus on the, probably the ones that aren't, aren't as mainstream that I'm excited about is, is 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 the the tools that just solve these really hard problems. So I mean, it's just like I would say, um, check out Patch. I mean, we've been yeah. checking with the Patch folks. Like they, they're you know they solve a lot of the things that we were just chatting about. Um, I, I think they're kind of in early days, but I think they're they've got such a thoughtful approach in this space. Um, I really like privacy privacy dynamics. Um, we do so privacy dynamics is essentially kind of like HIPAA compliance, data redaction governance for the modern data stack because i think like we're all as a as all these companies that are just getting into the modern data stack are are now maturing enough to the side to the scale where they need governance Mm -hmm. and need to talk like a gdpr and ccpa and hipaa compliance and so like i'm super excited about that i i think we're just going to see a lot more of that um and i i mean like i mean like i'm also really excited about companies like high touch and that it, it is it is any time that, that, you know, so clients bring us in to solve data problems and to build these kind of data to be able to answer questions. It's like level two, level three value to actually build production systems. And I think like, you know, on the journey to building production applications and, and generating value, like I think reverse ETL is huge. Um, I'm trying to think like, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of excited to see like the observability, um, the lineage CICD testing space mature. It just feels a little wild westy these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, I think that in about 12, I say 12 to 18 months, you'll see a lot of consolidation um, and just uh, like, pro- like more, like more broader products that, that tick a lot of those use cases. Um, but right now, like that feels like a space where there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there, mm-hmm. but, but uh, like everything's kind of a point solution. Yeah, I'd also like to see a little bit of less like black boxiness in those solutions. Ooh, tell me more. So I feel like, I mean, and th- this may be just like a little bit of lack of knowledge on my part. Like mm-hmm. um, you can't imagine what their abstraction is or like what exactly you're going to get once you use those products. You always hear about like the, the solution being extremely effective and reducing things like downtime. But what I'm looking for is like, like things like, for example, open lineage show you exactly what this thing will work like. You know exactly what kind of events you'll collect, and then you know exactly what that DAG will look like that shows you the lineage of your data. So you can imagine why uh, working with a product like that is going to benefit your organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would love to see like more like abstractions like that for observability that just kind of show you like an open standard. Yeah. For, like, here's what we're trying to observe. Here's the different markers that we like assess for, um, and then like given those like be able to build off of that and like understand yeah. the concepts basically. Yeah, I mean, I feel like everyone's kind of going their own approach. And I think having some more consolidated standards will definitely be- behoove us. I-, I think you're just going to see lots of consolidation over the next couple years. Yeah, yeah. 
it's just it's just too many too many companies out there. Okay. Like I, honestly, like one of the things like I was I was excited to hear when when Astronomer bought Datakin. Like I thought that was like super mm-hmm. smart move to just evolve and from from a kind of managed airflow to actually be a full service orchestration observability and lineage platform. Like that's brilliant. Like that that's the kind of moves that I think that. Or, you know, or um, Airbyte buying Grouperu. I mean, I think mm-hmm. like the in and the out, like this this kind of just consolidation, you're going to end up with a lot more complete products. Yep. I'm very excited about that. Yeah. And it's kind of funny that we're saying that because the name of the show is Best of Breed. Oh, um, yeah, it's true. Oh. Best of Breed. We're going to get to Best of Breed through consolidation. Yeah. Uh-huh. you actually, And that's the thing, right? Like everyone wants to say that like Best of Breed means that you have to do only one thing extremely well. Um, mm-hmm. And we actually have a different perspective with Hightouch, which is that you should solve one problem space. Um, and that doesn't mean that you do just one thing, but that one problem space might actually lead you to do many things um, for the same user or for similar users in a company. Yep. And so like one thing that we noticed is like batch accomplishes 95% of use cases, but just like you mentioned, there's every once in a while that client that will say, well, actually that worked for me for most use cases with Snowflake, but now I want real time for this one thing and it's personalization my iOS app. Obviously mm-hmm. my personalization can't be run like I can't, can't be waiting for Snowflake to return a query, right? And yeah, so totally. Those are the kinds of cases where like someone else would say, no, reverse ETL is just batch. You can't go outside of that. Um, mm-hmm. And we would say, no, we, we do solve personalization use cases today. Um, we have a pretty like rudimentary way to do it, which is that we get Snowflake data into a faster database like Postgres or MySQL. And yeah. there's a framework that we're working on now to make that much more interesting and much faster. So yeah, totally. that's where like, it may not be called reverse ETL anymore, but that's because we don't really care about sticking to reverse ETL. We care about solving the problems that people are throwing at us that could be solved with a similar abstraction. Totally, I, totally. And I think you're you're going to end up with these like multi-approach solutions because just having batch for everything isn't going to work. Having streaming for everything isn't is going to be overkill. Yeah. And just having a solution that can do batch streaming, some sort of like, you know, VPC peer. AWS private link or like, you know, secured without going on the public internet mm-hmm. data transfer. Like that's going to be, you're just going to need tools that just have a broad range of support for different use cases. Yeah, totally. Cool. So I'm going to switch a little bit of a gear outside of um, regular sure. stuff, but how has like, I guess my understanding is Brooklyn data has grown like crazy in terms of headcount. Yes. Um, how has the org changed and like what set you guys apart to increase so sharply in headcount and growth. Yeah, I mean, I I think that so so we're a little over eighty people right now. That's um, incredible. I know it's it's bonkers. And it was what, my... the the year. What's that? In the beginning of the year. How big was it? Forty two. Forty two to eighty. That's insane. Forty two to eighty. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 been fun. I mean, I think what we did really really well is 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 that we put the foundations in place early on, investing in kind of process, technology, security, um, training, leadership, so that Mm -hmm. when there was the opportunity to grow, we could grow. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think on the flip side, it's like, why do we have the opportunity? I think what you're seeing out there is this, this this massive desire for thought leadership in the modern data stack. Mm -hmm. So you have great tools great platforms out there that are that are kind of creating demand and solving really great like really hard problems but there's a gap of just someone to think be thoughtful and bring it all together Mm -hmm. and and i think you know what we what we've tried to do from very very early on is is not be like we're an xyz shop like a you know this shop or that shop or we do this tool Mm -hmm. we have always crafted custom solutions Mm -hmm. from our you know, early days of working with seed and series A companies to now working with fortune 500s. Um, and the great thing is when you're crafting custom solutions, that scales. And so what we're finding is just great, great growth, great opportunities working with like cool companies of all, all shapes and sizes. And the coolest thing is like these like tools that I've been playing around with for like what's DBT I started using in 2016 or something mm-hmm. like that. Like now gigantic companies are starting to use it and, and and they need smart folks that are experienced and those smart experienced folks you know you go to Accenture you go to McKinsey you go to these larger companies they've been using dbt and dabbling for a year it's like 
you know, I've been, I've been doing this for six years nonstop. You know, mm -hmm. I've implemented DBT at 90 different companies, you know, like I've implemented Snowflake at 60 different companies. I've implemented Fivetran at 40 different companies. Mm -hmm. We're Fivetran like, you know, um, America's partner of the year. It's like, that's the, the blue kind of teardroppy statue. Like you just, it's really cool. And I think we've gotten very, very lucky, but the cool thing is we have a depth of experience that I don't think a lot of folks have in the space. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I love about it is, is not just the variety, but we kind of have the incentive and the culture to think about the craft of data. And so, you know, not only are we implementing DBT 90 different times, but we're writing an open source style guide about how to, you know, like we're thinking about what is the best way to write DBT. Mm -hmm. And it's not a static document. It's evolving over time. You know, we're thinking about what's the best way to build a data-driven culture. What's the best way to roll out a BI tool? You know, uh, and, and I think, you know, we're we're just a culture of just people that love this stuff and just love solving hard problems, but like abstracting them big enough to, you know, just like I just don't think there's as much thought leadership, but people just solving these like meta meta challenges in, in the modern data stack and, and i think we're, we're just kind of set up to be able to do that it just it i feel like i love my job every single day i just pinch myself that i get to play with these tools and work with some of the smartest people i ever met to solve fan, fantastic and fascinating data problems yeah that's incredible um i mean we've already benefited from one of your thought leadership guides around compensation for data practitioners oh cool because we have we have a head of data pedram but we uh, just hired our first ic Amazing. And we were we we like wouldn't have known about the bands if if you hadn't published that so transparently. Yeah, and so like you know we've got you could look it up for those of you that are watching. Like we've got some blog posts. We did a talk at Coalesce last year about uh, kind of you know hiring diverse data teams. We run a completely um, anonymized hiring process. You know you don't you don't submit a resume. You just answer five or six questions relevant to the job. Okay. And it's like, it's awesome. And and what happens is we've got a phenomenal, we've been able to double in size in four or five months and the quality, like the caliber of the teammate and not just like, you know, skills, but just like, do I want to work with these people? Do mm -hmm. like, do they push me to learn? It, it hasn't suffered. The team is phenomenal. And so I, cause she's, I'm very happy that, um, that, that you benefit. Like we, we think so much about hiring and data cultures and just like my goal, my goal is literally, you know, Yes, I want to be delivering data products, but I want to build the best place to work. If you want to learn about data, if you want to see more things, if you want to just grow more in this modern data stack, I want to build a place that like, and you want to bring your whole self to the job and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and kind of, you know, be who you are and work in a place that respects you. Like that's, that's the goal. And yeah, that, that, there's nothing more important than that. Like, it's like the same thing that people ask us, right? Like, you're a SaaS company. Aren't you so excited to make this much revenue this year? And I'm like, what, ma what matters if you're not building a great place to work where people actually can like be themselves, right? Like every single person that should, that like hopefully joins Brooklyn or Hightouch should feel like they can literally just be themselves, talk as themselves, use many emojis as they want. Mm -hmm. uh, like I use like six exclamation marks in each sentence and sometimes people judge me for it. And I'm like, well, that's my personality. Like, oh, I was literally telling someone the other day, like <laughs> I've so gotten over sending every single email every single sentence with an exclamation point it's like i'm, I'm happy i'm gonna be yeah happy. exactly yeah um that's a good note to end. that's like let's end this on a um yeah exclamation point like it's, it's like it feels good it. let's have a good week good weekend yeah. no data thanks everyone for joining in uh thanks scott for your time as well and everyone have a great weekend cool. have a great weekend everyone bye everyone see, see ya